year 158 AC, King Daron I Targaryen had invaded and captured Dawn in quick and decisive fashion, to the surprise of all. But looking back through the last 150 years of Targaryen history, it shows us capturing Dawn is one matter, controlling it was another altogether. The people of Dawn were tough and strong willed and would not idly sit back and allow themselves to be subjugated by a foreign invader without a long and bloody hard fought fight. Almost as soon as Sunspear was taken, bands of rebels and outlaws popped up all across Dawn. While for now, nothing more than a nuisance for Daron, but an issue that would need to be dealt with before it grew into a bigger, more dangerous problem. However, King Daron did quickly consolidate his control of Dawn, dealing with these small bands of rebels when he found them, be it in the desert or in the high passes of the Red Mountains. The king knew if he was to keep his new conquest, no mercy could be shown to the outlaws, but ridding himself of these rebels was not without difficulty. In fact, it could be argued that putting down each and every band of outlaws took longer and was more troublesome than the actual invasion. In one infamous episode, a poison arrow meant for the king was instead taken by his cousin, Prince Amon, the youngest son of Prince Viserys. The young prince, who was 22 years of age, was sent home by ship from Sunspear to recover. While Amon did survive the incident, there were some who feared for the prince's life when he boarded the ship back to King's Landing. Even so, by the year 159 AC, the hinterlands were pacified, the rebels under control, and the young dragon, King Daron, was now free to return in triumph to King's Landing, with Dawn firmly under the control of House Targaryen. The king did not trust any of the Dornish lords to keep his peace in his new kingdom, so Lord Tyrell and a contingent of the royal army and fleet stayed in Dawn to keep the peace. There were some fears that the removal of so much of the Targaryen force from Dawn would spark new uprisings, but Daron had an answer for that. He hoped would prevent this. As assurance for Dawn's future loyalty to the Iron Throne and good behaviour, 14 highborn hostages of the greatest houses of Dawn were carried back with King Daron to King's Landing to act as hostages and with the hopes that these hostages in the capital could build bridges between the Dornish houses and the rest of the Seven Kingdoms. The sons and daughters, almost all the great houses of Dawn were selected. All had to send a hostage. All willingly did. This tactic proved less effective than Daron might have hoped. Whilst the hostages helped ensure the continued loyalty of their own blood, the king had not anticipated the tendencies of Dawn's small folk on such a massive scale. The issue was the king had no hold on them or way of keeping them in line such as the great houses. 10,000 men, it is said, died in the battle for Dawn. 40,000 more died over the course of the following three years as common Dornishmen fought on stubbornly against the king's men. Lord Tyrell, whom Daron had left in charge of Dawn, valiantly attempted to quell the fires of rebellion, travelling from castle to castle with each turn of the moon, punishing any supporters of the rebels with the noose, burning down the villages that harboured the outlaws, and so on. But the small folk struck back, and each new day they found their supplies stolen or destroyed, camps burned, horses killed, and slowly the count of the dead soldiers and men-at-arms rose, killed in the alleyways of the Shadow City, ambushed amidst the dunes, murdered in their camps. But the true rebellion began when Lord Tyrell and his train travelled to Sandstone, where his lordship was murdered in a bed of scorpions. As word spread of his demise, open rebellion swept Dawn from one end to the other. Dornish letters recorded in Maester Garth's Red Sands suggest that Lord Corgyle, Lord of Sandstone himself, arranged for Lord Tyrell's murder. However, his motives were subject of speculation in later years. Some say he grew angry that his early show of loyalty by putting an end to the rebel rousing of one of the more notorious rebel lords was given such little consideration by Lord Tyrell, while others claimed that his initial aid was all part of a treacherous plan he made with his Castilian to lull the king and Lord Tyrell into trusting him. In 160 AC, the young dragon himself was forced to return to Dawn to put down the rebels. He won several small victories as he fought through the Boneway, while Lord Alan Oakenfist descended once again upon the Planky Town and the Greenblood, apparently broken and defeated in 161 AC. The Dornishmen agreed to meet to renew their fealty 
and discuss terms of surrender, but it was treachery and murder they plotted, not peace. In a bloody betrayal, the Dornish attacked the young dragon and his retinue beneath a banner of peace. Three knights of the Kingsguard were slain attempting to protect the king, with a fourth, to his eternal shame, who threw down his sword and yielded. Prince Aemon, the dragon knight, the youngest son of Prince Viserys, was once again wounded, and this time captured, but not before cutting down two of the betrayers. The young dragon, King Daron himself, died with the Sword of Kings, Blackfire, in his hand, surrounded by a dozen enemies, cutting down several before being overwhelmed and cut down himself. King Daron I's reign was thus only four short years in length. He died at the age of only 18. While he did achieve great feats during his short reign as king, his ambition had proved too great, and he paid the price. Glory may be everlasting, yet it is fleeting, as well soon forgotten in the aftermath of even the most famous victories, if they lead to great disaster. Thank you.